Geeky Classic Rock. Not only was she married to the founder and one of the pioneers of psychedelic rock, Susan Joy Ballin. Susan, we totally appreciate you being here and thank you. Thank you for thinking about Marty. And- of course, of course. I, I mean, there's such a rich history here. It's it's pretty incredible. And also, what must be kind of incredible to you, now it's two years since Marty has passed, has it seemed like a blur to you? Um, I still cry every day. Oh. I miss him like I'm missing a part of my body. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think that'll ever change. I, I don't think it's blurry because... Everything about our life together was so um, so distinctly clear, <laughs> you know. So I think it's just hard, you know, just hard to not have his reflection back at me in the physical sense. Right. So it, it, it's hard. Yeah. Love to know how you and Marty met. So um, Marty and I met when um, I was living in New York with my daughter for the summer who was studying at the Joffrey Ballet, and I had a client back home in the Tampa area, they kept calling me and saying, you've got to come and cover this event, you have to, and I I never miss any events that this client had asked me to cover, but I kept saying, no, I'm I'm staying in New York, there's no way, I've, you know, I'll get you another photographer, but I can't make it, and this client was very persistent, and I just was persistent back, saying, I can't, I can't, and he kept saying, but it's Marty Ballin of the Jefferson Airplane, and again, I kept saying, I could not make it. It was impossible. I had a lot of responsibility in the city. And I had an emergency, and I had to come back to the Tampa area. And I don't know if this client had a tracker on me or what, but I didn't step off the the plane within two seconds. He called me, and he said, you're here. You have to come and cover this event. And I couldn't get out of it, so I did. And while I was there, um, I first of all, I have to share with you that I did not even know. I, I, I was a big follower of the Jefferson Airplane. I loved the, the airplane, but I heard more about Grace. I didn't really know about each individual band member. When Marty got up and sang Miracles and all the other songs, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I was like, amazing, because when he was popular, you know, I, I wasn't going into Madison Square Garden at the time. I had to go by what you saw on an album cover, you know, and anyway... Um, I covered the event, and the next thing I know, my client says that he's working on this project with Marty, and he needs to have some photographs done in the studio. So um, he came into the studio with you know a bunch of other musicians, and that went well. And the next thing I know, I had a big gallery, a, a, a big gallery studio. My sister had a gallery in St. Augustine. And the next thing I know... Um, this client says, you know, he paints, Marty paints, and this would be a great place to have, you know, some sort of exhibit. So the next thing I knew, I was at Marty's house with, you know, and he pulled out all of his paintings in the living room, and they blew me away. And within 48 hours, all the paintings were in my gallery hanging, and we decided to start a series of um, exhibits and performances called Music of My Life. And I could fit 120 people. My gallery was kind of like a very cool kind of um, like Soho, high ceiling, skylights, and it was perfect for him and for the sound. And uh, we started to have these Music of My Life series, and we just kept selling out. So it went on, you know, for months and months. And then finally we realized that... um, we need to open up a gallery. So we took over my sister's gallery in St. Augustine. But during this time, we were becoming friends and got to know each other really well. And um, we just, it, it was an accidental meeting, but it was serendipitous and, and uh, quite remarkable for both of us. And anyway, that's how we met. The, the first time I, he performed at my gallery, I had my father's fisheye lens on my camera, which was the one that he used taking pictures of actually Jefferson Airplane in oh Central my Park. Gosh, that's crazy. So that, that was before Marty and I were together, you know, as, as a couple. Um, but I just felt in, in that moment from my father's memory that I was going to break out his lens and use it and, and capture a subject that he copied, you know, that he photographed, you know, capture something that he once did, and 
for it to have grown into what it did, um, it's for me, it's just a, a story of the heart. It it's doesn't it it's very deep. <laughs> I think it was deep for both of us. So yeah, you know, if somebody were to tell me that I would have met him or married him, I I don't know. It just wouldn't have made sense. But the fact that we did meet and what we had together just did make total sense. It completed my life and it completed his. So that, you know, that is, um, that's my story on that end. I, I love that. Susan, I'm, I love that story. <laughs> Especially the fact that you're all about Gray Slick and Marty yeah, Ho. Yeah, you know, I... I <laughs> I, I really think, you know, and I, you know, being, you know, if, if we're moving into talking about my husband, which I accidentally always call Buck because that was what I called him. Yes. But, you know, I think like, you know, growing up on Long Island and, you know, sure, I, you know, everybody got, the, you know, when you were in uh, late junior high or high school, you got to take the Long Island Railroad in and go into Madison Square Garden. I saw my share of concerts, but... The airplane was very early on, Mm -hmm. and everything that came out was always about grace. And, you know, after being with Marty and, you know, learning so much about his his heartfelt story and his sentiments, um, the one thing that was very, very, um, very apparent was that he was told very early on, you know, that, that, you know, what do you care if somebody else gets the credit. There's not many female musicians on the stage. It was, you know, Grace and, and Janice and Mama Cass, you mm-hmm. know, and after that, you know, so, you know, my husband kind of just accepted that. But the truth is, is that, you know, he went through, he was such an in, instrumental part of the historical burst in San Francisco that I think my mission, even when, you know, he was alive, was to just, you know, tell his story. You know, just help him tell his story, and and I say this, and I it's very important that I say this. I, he did so many interviews, Kiki. You know, you know, with mm-hmm. your interview, he's documented so many times that I always say, you know, if you really want to know, not from me or from anybody else telling his story, um, you know, just find some of his interviews because he he tells it, you know, the same over and over. And I I always feel like I don't want to retell it and and not you know, kind of water it down or be like the game telephone. So I, I felt I wanted to share that. But, yeah, you know, I mean, he um, definitely had an interesting career and a lot of things that I think he struggled with. And in his passing, I want to carry the torch only in the respect that the things that might have been buried or not as well known get to surface on their own accord. Um, I'm in contact with Grace and Yorma and Jack, and, you know, they're all brilliant, incredible people. Uh, you know, Marty kept in contact. He performed at for Peace Ranch and, and at the Beacon Theater, you know, for Jack's 70th. So, I mean, it's important, you know, I mean, to keep the integrity of, of their history together. Absolutely. But in doing that, I also have this passion to, you know, kind of focus on Marty and, and some of the things that a lot of people may not know or that would be very intriguing to know. Now, what was a, a great memory that Marty shared with you about his musical past that you just kind of carry with you? Um, I would have to say that when he spoke about being on stage, it was like watching somebody uh, in, in this euphoria, <laughs> this euphoric state. Yeah. He loved, you know, he, he would tell... He would explain, you know, if you asked him what was, you know, the most important thing or something that meant so much to him, he he would say that being on stage was was probably it, that the exchange of energy between him and, you know, the audience was was uh, amazing, very powerful. And he once told a story, and he actually painted it, um, too. And again, you know, like he's, shared this in interviews many times, so I hope I don't dismantle it completely. But, you know, he said that there were numerous occasions that he would be singing on stage and the powerful energy was so there that he was like astro-projecting and that he could actually 
feel himself in the audience looking at himself on stage. And he said it was like overwhelming. You know, he just loved that. He loved his fans. He loved he just loved singing and being up there. Nothing else mattered, you know. I mean, yeah. he, his father was, you know, there to manage things most of his life, and so the business end of things and everything that was kind of boring to Marty or, or he would say small brain stuff, you know, he had the space to be creative and just go in. He was very lucky that way. Yeah, he, was, and, he had his room to be an artist. Yes, he had the room, and he knew that, and he felt very blessed for that. He really did. And I think that's what we see in his music and in his paintings is this full, wholehearted, soul-driven creation, you know, and, and um, he just didn't have anything. He, he astounded me, quite frankly, a lot, how he was able to um, put things to the side and be so in the moment. I think that's what I loved about him the most was I, his positive energy and, and um, his heart. I mean, I, I've always been a positive person, and I've always tried to be patient and and see the light in everything. And to to be with somebody that that you know just was all that and more. It was just like a fantasy. You know, our daily life was just um, just simple and magical. And you know, and while he loved to tour, and we got on the road every three months, and you know, it was just fantastic, but being home was just, um, I, I think that's what I miss the most. I, I finally had in my lifetime this partner that was um, just so positive and fun and brilliant and creative and, and just, there was, we just liked all the same things. You know, our day started with just being together and, you know, we loved listening to old radio, watching black and white films. It, we were just very a lot alike in our simple, humble way of living. Right. And, you know, it's funny. You talk about Marty's creativeness and his artistic side. The song Miracles that he did mm-hmm. and went to number three. I I love that song. I've loved it since I was a little girl. And just listening to it now, I feel like there are just different pieces of it. Every time I hear it, I always hear different pieces of it every single time. And yeah. Marty wrote that song. And the story is he wrote it in about 45 minutes, but he was so yeah. meticulous about the writing of that song. And you have, you are so fortunate to have, well, I don't know if you're fortunate. Sometimes you must feel overwhelmed, I think, with all the bins of notes and papers and thoughts that are all written down yeah. like when you ever pick up one of those pieces of paper do you feel like marty felt when he was on stage do you get transcended sometimes and feel like you're there his he he his family were keepers of of memories and thoughts they both they all were journal writers scrapbook keepers and it it, it really is a remarkable thing to think about what surrounded him as he was growing up so he became that, and it is overwhelming, but I feel like for some reason, and he felt that in his lifetime too, that for some reason I came along. I'm a good organizer, and, and I'm passionate about, like I said, dusting things off and keeping them alive, mm-hmm. and um, so I do have a big, I, I have a big job ahead of me. Um, while Buck was alive, while Marty was alive, um, you know, I tried to, to make sure that you know, he got to be and play where he wanted to. And, you know, that everything, like, for the first time in a long time was kind of, like, all coming from him. So, you know, he wasn't great on the computer, but I could take, the, I, and you know, all of his shows I would cover and photograph. So, but every single thing that he did with me was really coming from him. I was a good channeler. I could do the business end of things and just, get that going. So, uh, you know, so in his passing, I feel like there was a lot of unfinished business and a lot of things that he didn't want to die. You know, he really, that's why he was so strong and and survived like he did something that most people don't. Mm -hmm. And even the last few years of his life, like a lot of people will look back and say, oh, you know, they read 
something and they think, oh, he must have suffered and he was terrible. Well, he did share a lot of pain and suffering, but he did it with such a majestic, I can't even put words to it, Mm -hmm. desire to live and be positive. And that's what he was. And, And until his last breath, that's who he was. And so his work, his loose ends, his his notepads, they, they're, they're remarkable, they're plentiful, and I, I treat it as though each thing that he wrote in the moment was very important to him. So I have to be thorough, and I, I'm in the process of, of, you know, going through and separating, and it is a big job. We did have the first exhibit um, a year ago, June, um, in Tampa, and, and uh, I don't even know how it, it came to be, but it, he was he was alive at the time and was going to do a paint, you know, have his paintings exhibited. And when he passed away, um, the curator and the museum said, "Let's make it a tribute." And we worked our butts off, but that was the first dig into all of the papers and the journal, you know, everything. Mm-hmm. So I, I do have a big job ahead of me, but I'm I'm. I'm the keeper yeah. <laughs> keeper of the legacy, and I, I just want to keep his memory alive. I, I really, and I think he, he knew that I would, you know, so, um, so I will. But, yeah, it's, it is, each note that he wrote, he, he just was a deep-thinking human being. And, um, yeah, you know, it, it's... Is there I, anything... <laughs> Is there anything you found out about Marty while you've been going through these notes? Is there something you discovered, wow, you know, I didn't know he liked that, or I didn't know he wrote that? Is there anything? You know, you're going to think this is probably unbelievable, but no. Really? Because we spoke so often, and he shared so much on a deep level that almost every single thing that I'm finding is just a, is just in a written form of what he already shared verbally. Uh, he was a journal keeper, and you know, I, I also before I met Marty was like a nonstop journal writer, and you know, and part of our days was like you know laying around in our house was our journals, and um, you know, I I picked one up um, uh, actually when we when he ended up in the hospital. We had just been to the Grammys that January before in March. You know, he was on life support March 11th. Ugh. And, you know, whenever we traveled, he had his Sai Baba book in the suitcase and, you know, his whatever he was going to perform in, very light packer, it used to amaze me, and his journal. And, you know, while he, you know, we were in New York and in the hospital for just a week under five months. And so one day I just, while he was, he was in an induced, uh, coma for quite a long time, and I just one day sitting in the waiting room just pulled out his journal and his little notepad and started reading it. And it was everything that we experienced at the Grammys because it was pretty close in time, which was amazing. And it was so so important to him, you know, because they had just received the Lifetime Achievement Award. And you know, and, and it's funny that you asked me that question, Kiki, because the first thought that came to my mind after I read a few more journals was that it's almost everything that he said verbatim. He wrote it, and he shared it. So wow. it was the important things that he kept close to heart and would share. So, um, yeah, of course I'm not done. <laughs> I've got right. a lot of work to do. I don't know everything. There's no way. His own heart is his heart. I think that, you know, we were very deeply connected, but I, you know, obviously I wasn't there for a lot of it, but he was a good writer and he had no problem with um, sharing his heart in his writing. So um, that's the stuff that, you know, but he was very, also very upfront and very blatant about things. Like he was, you know, there was nothing that he was going to hide um, or not tell. So mm-hmm. I think that sometimes people may have a, tendency to write things in a journal that maybe a family member or somebody inherits that they find and they say, oh, I didn't know that. But I don't think, you know, that's not, that's not the case with him. Um, He pretty much told it, you know, he was very private. He was, he was private with the public in, in a lot of ways, but um, with close friends and with family, very intimate and close. 
and open. Now, I watched that interview when Marty was talking about Jerry Garcia, Janis Joplin, and Jim Morrison. And I, I have to tell you, Susan, I was more focused on, again, it would have been amazing to have met Marty, but I was focused on you in the mirror taking oh, pictures. I you were really observant. <laughs> because, I, because I'm listening to Marty, but watching you as mm-hmm. the wife of a man who was so in love with him and what he was saying. And mm-hmm. I, I'm thinking to myself is Marty. So I, I loved how he was telling the stories mm-hmm. and I wish I could have gotten a piece of, of that Marty because it was so incredible just what he's been through and experienced, but to watch you watch yeah. him and, and you, you again, you probably heard the stories 5 million times, well, but you, it, you know, the only way, thank you. But the, the thing that I think, amazes me is that I don't think of him like when I first met him mm-hmm. you know I I didn't know a lot about him and I fell in love with this man that was taking care of his disabled child right. and dedicated his life to her mm-hmm. and was Martin Jarrell Buckwald and the fact that he happened to have been Marty Ballin was beautiful but you know our home life and who he was and I think that was the sacred part of our relationship that he loved and that I loved too, was that we really, he was, he was just, he was, <laughs> he was Buck. He was just like this kid, this fun person, this brilliant person, this loving person. I didn't, you know, I loved hearing his stories. Oh, you know what I mean? But I, I don't have this, you know, like, and I never did have this, it sometimes surprises me because I say, oh, yeah, that's right. It's Marty Dallin. And, and, you know, even high school friends that, you know, later on found out that I was married to him. You know, I, I, it's very funny because it's almost surreal to me because it doesn't feel like anything. It just feels like I was with this incredible person that um, that just made my life complete. And, you know, and, and our personal life, like, you know, like he was so proud of everything he did, but it didn't consume him. He woke up each day and he just, that was a whole new day. You know, I mean, you know, he wanted to paint, he'd be out. That, that's what amazed me the most. You know, I, we were, I, you know, used to oil paint. He liked to paint with acrylic and I, I used to tease him. And I used to say, but you can't mix the colors. They dry so quickly. You know, I mean, like, you know, I'd sit there setting myself up, you know, and, and be ready for the long haul, you know, and, <laughs> and everything had to be like just right around me. And, you know, he could just go out and paint anywhere and just, you know, the thought came. He was so fluid. I think that's what I found the most remarkable. That's why it's not surprising that he wrote Miracles in, you know, that short period of time. He was very, very present and in the moment. Yeah. And that's what I loved about him. And so, like, all the stuff and the historical stuff, I, I was very proud. Don't get me wrong. Sure. I loved every second yeah. when he would do an interview or, you know, he'd be on stage and be looking at me and singing a song. Believe me. I loved every single moment, but I think what was the most important to me was just our holding each other and being together is just who we were. And we both found each other to be just the right person for that. Absolutely. Very simple. It's very humble. It's so weird, but that's, you know, that's really what it was. And I think for him too, that's why, you know, he felt a deep sense of, of, um, the destiny that, that, you know, he looked, he did. We spoke about this often. He was, I'm going to share something that I probably will butcher, but he said that when he was young and, um, you know, they were touring, the Jefferson Airplane was at their peak and they were touring Europe, you know, he was away for a while. He came home and he said that his whole life changed, that, you know, that even his parents were treating him awkwardly. Really? And he broke down crying and he says not you guys and they all started to cry and laugh and life went back to normal where the mother you know where Catherine would tell him when he was you know needed to be put in his place and pop you know so but he did say that you know from that moment on he never really knew because people treated him differently Mm -hmm. and so while I think he loved everything about his life and being on stage he also sacrificed a lot. And I think that was one of the things that um, 
that he had to push to the side and he he became private that way like he didn't know who to trust or who not and he he just you know that to me kind of was somebody that lived uh Two two sides of something very special. One that maybe had stopped me could have stolen. I have a different understanding about you know public figures, you know, because of seeing you know um, it does change your life. So um, so you know he really um, was unique. He 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 also. <laughs> I know he knows he thought he, you know, that, that he was popular. I mean, like he had every woman throwing themselves at him, even in his 70s, okay? You know, he really? was just a very special, <laughs> dear friends that, you know, I so speak funny. to every so often, and, and even fans, you know, like I'm always getting messages. I met him for five minutes. He let me in to a show that was sold out. He was so kind. Every single thing that has any kind of reference to my husband is, is truly a beautiful memory or story mm-hmm. about about a very humble, giving man, and that's who he was. And um, you know, and I feel very blessed and very lucky that I had that person in my life. Oh, of course, I, I can, I can really, you know, it, just how you're telling the stories, though, Susan. It's <sighs> connecting us, and it's it's allowing us into it a little bit. You know, of course, we'll never ever understand um you know who marty ballon we we know that he was a great man great human being great songwriter great performer but to just have you give us a little piece it's it's just so so cool i watched him like open doors that you know he 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 knew he did but that was another beautiful thing about him he always was interested in other artists work not you know i mean he First of all, he was an avid reader, and he loved anything that had to do with film, art, music, history. Um, he really, really loved early Hollywood, and, you know, he did a lot of reading and different biographies. Um, his his interests, you know, from Persian poetry to everything, I mean, like, I, I, I don't even know how he was able to, to absorb so much. I think that's probably the hardest thing for me when I think about when he, you know, is not here anymore to, to be able to enjoy indulging himself in that. I never saw anybody so excited about life and discovering things. So he was that way with artists, other musicians. And there wasn't ever a door that wasn't open. Let me hear what you got. Let's see what we can do. But he was also very honest if, yeah. if it wasn't going to work. Um you know, and, and I watched him create music with other musicians, and all I can say is that he orchestrated and pulled out the gifts that existed. If he was working with a gifted musician, which was hopefully his choice, he didn't always have, you know, a lot of choices around him in um, maybe in, in the Tampa area versus San Francisco way back. But But he always put himself to the side and opened his eyes and looked and saw what this person had. And he would pull out a thread and then another one and another one and, and start weaving these threads together. And I know that he did that with the airplane too. I know that he did that with Jefferson Starship. From now when I look at footage of different things, I say to myself, well, he's just never changed. So the door was open, and all he wanted to do was create stuff. It didn't matter if it was his or his and somebody else's. That's all that mattered, was that he that something gets created that other people are going to enjoy. And, and I found that also like pretty intense for you know a musician to push their own ego away. Of course, of course, because you, know, you, you don't hear that a lot. But. No, you don't. And, and I can tell you a lot of the people around him you know, um, we're not like him. And, uh, you know, it's, it even is astounding to me that he, you know, didn't get spoiled or, or um, he just made sure that he wouldn't, you know, that he would just keep the music pure for himself. And he, he I think that he definitely had his struggles and had to learn how to, you know, um, sort of cut off the 
hurt or disappointment in some areas, but he mastered it and said, nah, that was that. Here's the moment now. Not going to waste it. He, yeah. he had a bunch of, um, you know, quotes that I, I, I hear every day in my ear, you know, that were remarkable. And I, I remember the first time that he said some of these things, I was like, well, that's not good. You know, one time we were talking very early on, and he said, I've been stabbed so many times in my back that it's made of leather. And I remember saying, well, that's awful. He goes, no. He goes, now it's leather. I'm not getting hurt. I figured it out. You know, and, and, you know, early things. And then another one was the dead fruit falls from the cart. In other words, don't waste time on somebody that did something that was not very good. Why revisit it? you know, comma or something will just undo it by its own. So he never wasted time on petty things. And the next thing was he would say small brains. Like, why would you want to waste your time on small brains? In other words, not to say that his brain was great and that he was great. It was more to say, you know, it didn't feel good the first time. I'm not going to bring it in the second time. So he truly was in the moment and, um, you know, moved on. And, and I think that's why he was so prolific. You know, he didn't get stuck on things. He just wanted, he was like the cookie monster. He just wanted to keep going and gobble it up and take it in. And, and, um, I wish he could have, he definitely, um, his pop lived till, you know, a week short of 94. Oh, wow. And um, I thought for sure Buck would be with, you know, me to 100. We used to, we used to watch, you know, the Smucker's um, jar, you know, they, on, on, um, I forget which show it is, they show everybody on a picture of somebody who reached 100. Yes. Uh, you know, and, <laughs> and, you know, we used to That's us. Kid, <laughs> yeah, we used to kid each other and say, you know, oh, you know, we'll be on the Smucker's Draw one day. And I thought for sure he would be. <laughs> yeah. Know, so. But, you know, as much as Marty has given good back to people, he's gotten good, too, because in 1996, Jefferson Airplane was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's pretty incredible. 2016, he got the Lifetime Achievement Award at the 58th Grammy Awards. You were there by his side. And now next year, they're getting a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Right. What well, he, he really was grateful. He loved every moment of his life. Oh, definitely. What do you think he would say about that star? Well, I was on the phone with everybody. We have group calls every six weeks when when it was announced. And it was funny because, you know, I think the sentiment was, wow, you know, like this is kind of crazy, you know, like, you know, look at us, hippie, you know, the hippies that could care less and whatever. But I think at this point, and I think my husband would be very proud too, I think, you know, he took everything with a grain of salt. So it was kind of like, oh, yeah, that'll be fun. <laughs> you know, if it comes to pass and, and we're there, it'll be fun. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so I think he would embrace it. I think whatever the other guys and, and Grace and Yorma and Jack, like he would be a team player and they're all embracing it. So it's, it's, very wonderful. It really is, you know, and, and, um, did you ever get to meet Grace? I did. I did. I did. I, I, um, ah, uh, it was a great visit. Um, can only imagine. I can only yeah. imagine. Yeah. Well, I, the first time I met Grace was, um, we were in San Francisco and, and Buck was performing at the Throckmorton, which was one of his favorite places in a theater in um, Mill Valley. And that weekend, Grace had an art opening um, down by the wharf. And we thought we were going to miss her the opening night because Marty was performing. And that next Sunday, we went to see the exhibit. And it was really kind of cute because she was leaning against a pole, you know, a telephone pole, smoking a cigarette. And, you know, Buck went knocking behind her, we were surprised that she was still there, actually, and tapped her on the shoulder, and she turned, and he moved to the other side like a five-year-old, right? <laughs> and didn't see who it was, and then he popped out, and she was like, Marty, what are you doing here, you know, and so grace, and so that was the first time, and it was really, in fact, um, we bought a painting he, she did of Janis Joplin, which I'm looking at right now wow. in my living room. So that was the first time. But then when um, Buck passed away, you know, I had called everybody and um, it was hard. You know, it was 
just a hard, hard thing. And, and um, I, that June, um, the Hate Street Fair in the city of San Francisco, we're uh, going to do a tribute to Marty. And um, also in Mill Valley, they had the uh, Millie Awards that he won, and he was alive when he won that, so we thought he wasn't well enough to travel, but that he would be a part of that. So that summer, it was, um, it feels like it was 10 years ago, but it was a year ago this wow. past June. Um, you know, I was in San Francisco uh, with Jenny, Marty's oldest daughter, and um, my, you know, our kids and family and at the Hate Street Festival, but then I went on to L.A. to um, meet and take care of some business, and so while I was there, I got to go over to Grace's home and um, have a morning with her, and it, I, I think it was probably the most healing thing and wonderful thing that could have happened, you know, and, and it just felt really good, and she's 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 great. She's a pisser. I mean, she really tells it like it is. But we were talking about parenting and how, you know, she was with her parents and, you know, how she felt like later on that, you know, she must have really been tough. You know, it was very, very, very cool. And and then also Yorma and Jack, you know, I mean, um, last year uh, my daughter got married in Tulum and I was going through New York and I didn't think I would be able to make it in time, but Yorma and Jack were playing at Town Hall in New York City, and I texted Vanessa really quickly, and I said, it may be too late, but can I get in? And right away, Vanessa said, go, you know, sure, go. And, and you know, I, I cried the whole time because I was listening to Water Song and all their incredible music that yeah. Jack and Yorma, you know, with Hot Tuner did. And, you know, it, it was just a, something I just felt I needed to do. And after I got to spend, you know, good amount of time with Yorma, and and it just felt good, you know, I mean, um, they're remarkable people, you know, and everybody had crazy moments and did crazy things, and everybody can tell a different story, but in the end, you know, the music that they that they created speaks for itself, and um, so it felt good, it felt good, I felt like I was there for Buck a lot, you know, like, to just say, hey, you know, so we cool. did what we did. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's true, the music... I say it all the time, music is what brings all of us together. At the end of the day, no matter what's going on all around us, you put on a good song and it just makes us feel so much better. And September 27th is going to be the two-year anniversary of Marty's passing. So what is the one thing that brings you joy and happiness when you're writing, thinking, or talking about Buck? Well, I... You know, when somebody passes away, people tell you things and you say, man, that won't be me, but it's a weird journey. Um, you know, I moved from the Tampa house and in, into a house in St. Augustine right now. I'm figuring life out, you know, for me and Delaney. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up thinking that I, you know, at first I couldn't take anything out that reminded me of our life together because I just couldn't keep it together. I would just break down, and then a few months ago, like actually it was Buck's birthday last January, that I just said, you know, enough of this. I, I need to feel the things that were important. I have a shirt that still smells like him. It sounds crazy. I travel with it. And, you know, it's just like you do these weird things to recall a memory or feel the presence in a physical way of somebody Absolutely. that's deeply in your heart. Yes. So I, I set up, he, he had an altar, a little, little thing in, in our bedroom, that he had for years that, um, you know, had important things on it. And the whole wall in our bedroom was filled with his family photos on cork boards and, and then ours. And so I had an extra bedroom here, and I set it up to kind of be like our bedroom, which, you know, um, I don't even know how and why I did that, but it feels really good. It's kind of like the sacred place for me to catch a moment. Yeah. And um, I, I think that where I find my most peace is I, I close my eyes and I think about him and I find it all the time. But um, I have a little ritual where I have a heart that, you know, a gold locket around my neck that has a picture of, of him and myself in it that he gave me. And his, a little bit of his ashes are there with a lock of his hair. And, and 
my husband was uh, cremated, and um, I didn't know what I was going to do. It just just kind of happens naturally. And I went to Mount Tam, which was his favorite place, with Delaney and Jenny and my daughters and family. And after we had a memorial, I thought I was just going to go up to the top of the mountain. Deborah Schwartz was this incredible mountain tour person for Mount Tam and her heart. She led us right out to this incredible place and it was beautiful and at that moment we all agreed that it was time to let Marty's ashes go but they didn't you know not all of the ashes go some of them cling behind Mm -hmm. and so I ended up coming home with this you know I with my husband's ashes part you know most of them were gone and it was what was supposed to happen. I was like, well, what do I do now? You know, like, am I going to go back and and burn this and make it ash and let it go? But then there'll still be some left. You know, it was, it's just this trip you take that I, you just take it. And so I have this, my peaceful moments are when I go into that room and I look at the altar and our wedding pictures. And he, he was a card writer, a professor of love and all of his cards are spread out and open upstairs and in that room and where I work. And, and I see his words surrounding me all the time, all the time. And I think my greatest moments of peace and connection with him is when I feel sad or lonely. I go up there and I connect with him. And I feel his love and his energy. So um, that's probably where I find um, just thinking about him, just, you know, Stopping a busy moment and... Um, Taking it all in. Yeah, you know, he did that. He, you know, he was hospitalized for five months and went through a lot after, and nurses used to come in, doctors used to come in and say, how are you always so kind and smiling? And and he said, I meditate, you know, and, and he did. He really did. And I never knew how to meditate, you know, um, but I think from being with him you know, the higher level of just learning how to turn something off long enough to just feel the moment um, is something that I I think all of us kind of lose and don't know how to do. But I think he was a good teacher just by being around him. So he left me that gift. Well, I think you've given us so much today. And uh, honestly, I I can't thank you enough. I really can't. I can't thank you enough. You're remembering him and caring. Well, what is what is next, Susan? Because you know we have this whole world event going on. So, and, and you had an exhibit for him last year. So, do you plan to do everything online, or do you plan something physical in the future? All physical, mm-hmm. and it takes time, but it's in the motion. Um, my husband kept you know journals for every year of his life, and he also kept a bin for every year. So, whatever cards, whatever interviews was thrown into the bin. Um, I, I think there will be a book, and it will be his book, his words. That'll take time. Um, my husband did a film called In the Mansion. We worked on it for five years before his heart attack. It was supposed to be um, a, a love letter <laughs> to the Jefferson Airplane during their 50th anniversary, wow. and we never released it yet. And it's it's not really, it's not a documentary or a rockumentary. It's truly a collage of Marty Ballin and, and his thoughts from 13 hours of film that was filmed in the mansion that he did with Spencer Dryden. And um, so I want to get that out. Um, That's the incredible. Exhibit, incredible. The exhibit, the first one was curated, and it will stay intact, but there's so much others that um, hopefully curate and get on the road. I've been trying to um, get things set up. Usually things get onto the block. Now everything is so thrown off. Right. I have to see where it goes. But, you know, usually an exhibit in a museum, um, you book it a year, two years in advance. So I'm going to be working on that. I have been. And then um, he, my husband did an album before he had the heart attack and the injuries called Feeling the Love Again. And um, it was never released the right way, so that will happen. Nice. Um, you know, um, his just things will propagate, you know, as I keep unpacking. But 
Um, you know, those are the things that come to mind um, first, and, and people want to see it and are appreciating, you know, um, that there is, you know, more more things, you know, that um, that he did that, you know, can be shared still. So it kind of keeps his his spirit going. And you are doing a phenomenal job. <laughs> I, I really just combing through and, and the videos and the pictures and the words. It, it's just very, very incredible. I cry a lot. Let me leave it at that. I cry a lot. But it, it's not bad tears. Yeah. It's, it's bittersweet, beautiful. Like, like it, it just makes you feel so alive that you could be so moved. Heartfelt. But, yeah. Yeah. But it, it's, it's, thank you for, for, for um, saying that. But it, it feels just very natural. It just feels like, you know, like um, flows that way. Well, you have an amazing love story and some words that Marty had written to you in a journal. He said, your words have wings, so fly, my darling. Fly as far and as high now you're gonna make me cry. as you can. I, I'm not here to make you cry, but you know no, what? No, 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 no. Those no. words... Nothing. It doesn't take a lot. It's a beautiful tear. I, I really mean it. Those words, but, for you to have experienced the love that you did with Marty... Again, we appreciate you sharing because it, it it is hard for you. You can tell it's hard for you, but again, like you said, it's happy as well because it's you're happy. Sh- it's it's beautiful. Yeah, and, you know. I do you want to say one last thing, Kiki? So many people meant so much to him, and vice versa. Mm-hmm. That you know, the like I I feel a great loss, of course, and I feel very sad. But I also feel very. It's a weird sort of journey because I feel so sad for so many people who miss him. Too, you know, from from his friends to his daughters to to fans, you know, to, to you know, it's just like I he is so well missed by so many that I I am not the only one, you know. I mean, I I know that there's a lot of tears from close friends that cry, you know, and miss him, and they come to mind all the time. And Jesse Barish, you know, I mean, in in L.A., you know, he he's he was probably up until the very end, you know very dear, you know, Buck would be on the phone with him at least once a week for a couple of hours. So many people, you know, Slick, Aguilar, just, you know, friends from, from you know, the past, you know, uh, you know, his friend Trish and Gail and Vic. There's so many people that, that meant so much to him and they're, they're at a great loss too. So, uh, you know, Kiki, I want to say something. You should not, you should think very, like, think special, Kiki. Think special because, you know, it took a lot for him to speak. He really, he enjoyed doing that interview with you, and it was monumental for us, actually, oh. if he could do it. Oh. And um, I was honored. I want you to know that. Well, thank, yeah. thank you, because honestly, I got off the phone, and I'm like, I just spoke with a legend. Like, I just spoke <laughs> with a legend, and I, I did cry, I will be honest Aww. with you, because I, I, I just, I said, oh my gosh, I just spoke with the creator of Jefferson airplane. And it it was, and I thank you for allowing me to have that moment with Marty because it, it, it was his choice. All I did was connect the dots. He could have said no and you wouldn't have had, but he wanted to. And that's what I wanted you to know. He chose to do that. I never said, Oh babe, you have to do this. Never. You know, I just presented to him everything that came and he selected what he wanted and, there were plenty that he just didn't want to bother with, and he he chose to do your interview. Ugh. That was you should know that that was him. I was just Oof. merely the channeler of connecting the dots. <laughs> well, thank you for connecting those dots because it thank you. even to this day, and, and, and I don't want to sound sappy, but it just it really means a lot. <laughs> well, he's moving you along. I think. I think. Yeah, he is. He definitely is. He he definitely is. Well, Susan, thank you. Honestly, thank, thank you, Kiki. Thank, thank you for you so sh- much for your interest and for for knowing so much. You know, and I, I that's that, that's like that feeds my soul that that you care enough and that you know that um that you see you know because that's the stuff that I want people to see. You know, take notice. You know, go into the detail and find some pleasure in something that maybe you know existed and you didn't know about. You know, I'm hoping that that's what I can keep doing but you you really you you found a lot of good stuff 